Hi, everyone, and welcome back to the Petapixel podcast. Chris and Jordan are now back from their trip by the beach <laughs> where they were uh, enjoying podcasting from the most scenic location that they've podcasted <laughs> yet, right? You guys have not. Have you ever podcasted anywhere other than your house? No, Never. it was great. No, it was very exciting. And I'm sure the audience appreciated the quality of the sound last week. I'm sure that was great. <laughs> Actually, the sound wasn't bad. I thought it was sounded pretty good. I liked yeah. hearing the train in the background a little bit. Um, a little, <laughs> some slight, uh, like, ex- explanation of why things may have been a little weird is uh, I basically was, like, 15 seconds behind you because you're running on, like, your, your, sm- your yes. smartphone, Chris. So, like, I had to kind of guess when you were done with your topic before I could move us on to the next one. I feel like it edited pretty seamlessly. It did. Um, I don't think anyone noticed, but that was that was one of the tougher ones for me, at least. <laughs> this um, is great. It's like we're all in the same room again. Yeah, yeah, we're like, back to proper bandwidth. Ex- ex- exactly. Yeah. <laughs> um, so this week, we are going to talk about uh, one piece of gear that all of us will never get rid of. We're gonna, that's, that's our main story. But before we get to that, uh, we want to talk about a couple of, of news stories that broke last week. Um, SanDisk has... Basically, the, the floodgates opened on this. We'd been working on it for a couple months and was hoping that Western Digital, the owner of Sandus, was going to get back to us. They never did. So once, once The Verge published a story, we decided to go with it. Basically, uh, the don't buy anything Sandisk for a little while until they publicly acknowledge the problems that they're having. Um, would you guys buy a Contax G2 yes. for eight? For eight thousand five hundred dollars? <laughs> no, no. <laughs> uh, so the other thing I want to mention is there are no official DJI apps on Google Play. Madness. Zero of them are real. So if you see one on there, it's a scam. And this one I just added this morning. You guys probably didn't see it. <gasps> LG has put a television into a suitcase. So I kind of wanted to talk or, about yeah. that. Our so, kids are ruined forever. Uh, yeah, yeah. Why? Why go camping? Well, I mean, you just just take your living room with you. <laughs> uh, anyway, there we go. That's that's the stories this week. Let's get to it. Cartoon. We would once again like to thank the Petapixel podcast sponsor, OM System. This week, OM System proudly marks its participation in the annual World Photography Day celebrations, paying homage to the art of capturing moments through the lens. With a commitment to educating photography enthusiasts around the world about the OM System, the brand is excited to announce a week-long extravaganza of online events and content from August 15th to August 19th, 2023. First established in 2010, World Photography Day has become an internationally recognized occasion that unites photographers in celebrating their craft. OM System will offer a variety of engaging and educational content across its digital platforms, ranging from captivating visual showcases to insightful tutorials and interviews. A highlight of the celebrations includes a series of virtual live events hosted by OM System ambassadors and technical experts hailing from different corners of the globe. These events will be conducted in seven languages, fostering a diverse and inclusive atmosphere that transcends borders. That means no matter where you are, and as long as you speak one of those seven languages, you can take part in this. And if you're listening to the podcast, we know you speak one of them. (laughs) (laughs) That's all you'll ever get. (laughs) Participants can uh, anticipate interactive sessions, thought-provoking discussions, and valuable insights that will enrich their photographic journey. To amplify the excitement and extend the festivities, OM System is delighted to kick off the celebrations early, starting on August 15th. Photography enthusiasts, whether amateurs or professionals, are encouraged to participate in this enriching experience, exploring new horizons and pushing the boundaries of their craft. All offerings during the OM System World Photography Day celebrations are free of charge and and virtual. I want to remember to point that out. Free and virtual. In addition to the interactive sessions, OM System is giving away an OM5 camera and a 12 to 45 millimeter lens to one lucky winner. Nice. Uh, Before I give you guys all the link on where to find all this information, I do want to point out that I think it is very cool that a camera company is actually doing something substantial around World Photography Day. Uh, I don't know how common this is. This is the only company that I'm aware of that's doing anything. And it's kind of nice to see, right? Yeah, Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. 
I really like um, looking at this. You know, we, we certainly see a lot of the manufacturers doing like live streams where they're promoting products specifically or something like that. But I'm looking and we've got like uh, an ambassador doing a talk specifically on like doing better macro photography and things like that. Um, and I mean, Micro Four Thirds is a great system for macro work. So that makes a ton of sense. But uh, yeah, it looks very cool. There's like yeah. nine nine technical speakers here, uh, technical experts on this list. I mean, you were just saying like, yeah, maybe one or two live streams or whatever with one per the nine nine plus nine, yeah. plus like they're doing a bunch of special offers and stuff too. It's worth checking out. Um, participants it's the best price, yeah, free, right? Yeah, absolutely. Participants no, can no. learn how to enter the contest and access the full schedule of events by visiting explore.omsystem.com/petapixel. That link will be in the description below. Thanks again to OM System for sponsoring this yeah. episode. Yay! All celebrate, right. celebrate photography. It's a nice way to do it. Yeah, especially when it's, as you said, Chris, free. <laughs> that's that's the best. All right, <laughs> so let's get into it. Do you guys use SanDisk? Oh. I don't. I used to. All my memory cards were SanDisk for a while, but uh, I have absolutely nothing SanDisk behind me at my workstation here. Chris? Well, that's interesting. I mean, I, obviously, we, I, we use memory cards, right? Uh, SD cards. Uh, I, we have a lot of SanDisk cards. This is, you know, the real question is like, are there people out there that buy just one brand? You know, or or are there people that kind of buy what seems to fit their price range and whatever? And you know, I fall into that latter category. That, right? You know, yeah, I'd it's like got to be. Buy... But you knew, but the Sandisk brand had weight, right? You knew yeah, them; sure. they they had value. People, okay, so this isn't and their Western memory. Western Digital did too, absolutely, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, Western Digital as a brand has suffered greatly over the last year. Yeah. They've had multiple <laughs> like catastrophic failures of like hard drives, especially their NAS network attached storage. Those things have just been collapsing. But this Yikes. past week. Uh, SanDisk portable SSDs were rep- like a multiple versions of them. So there's the one that's like the black with the orange like like carabiner hook. Yeah, and then yeah. there's this newer one that I'm holding right here. This is uh, technically called the I mean, Pro G40. Great. Yeah, this is this. I was excited about this, the Pro G40, because the NAND flash in here was supposed to be like I looked it up. It was a, like a reliable one. Mm-hmm. Something is, else is happening when they're putting these in enclosures because both that iconic one with the orange little carabiner hook and this are failing and not yeah. just like a little bit, but like data complete loss. Like the, like yeah. you put something on here and it's just, it's crashing out computers that are connected to it. Data is just gone. Uh, and SanDisk, not saying a word. Hasn't yeah. spoken to any outlet about this. We actually waited a couple months, giving them enough time to recover from like their NAS failures, because one of them was so bad it took out their email system for two weeks. Wow. We couldn't get an email <laughs> to Western Digital. But The Verge wrote a story, and we followed up on it. Basically, like, yeah, we agree; these are failing. Don't buy them. I mean, I feel like I've been hearing rumblings of this mm-hmm. for the last six months uh, when I was looking at drives, uh, just nothing official, you know, a lot of hearsay of like, oh, I'm hearing these. And I think I was even talking with you about this, Jaron, probably when you got started looking into this and it was like, yeah, dodge those sand disks when we were talking about hard drives. Yeah. And it's a shame because I love the form factor of the classic sand disk rugged drives. Like you said, Jaron, they're, they're like pretty iconic and I feel like had a pretty good reputation previously yeah, but something yeah, happened recently something yeah. changed to the point where um i think i mean i'm positive western digital knows and the reason i'm positive they know is the only actual response we've gotten from them is that they keep cutting the price of these yeah, yeah. they keep ma- they, yeah they're trying to get rid of them and basically at the cost of their consumers because when you buy one of these at whatever price you buy it for yeah very high chance that it's just garbage but who wants to admit that right i mean who wants to say it because it's one of those industries maybe more than than almost any other industry where it's like the name that's associated with your products has to be associated with reliability and any sort of bad press on that name you know hard drives are something that honestly are quite mysterious to most people we don't exactly know what's going on how they're built what technology they're using which chips they're using where they come from we have no idea right so not unless you crack them open so People really have to go off that name, that that history, that sort of longevity. Uh, I do know some people who are like brand loyal to their storage devices because they maybe even superstitiously feel like they've never had a failure. And of course, every single brand has had failures, bar none. 
And, yep. uh, you know, we've all had bad experiences and, and we've always heard a lot of people have bad experience like, oh, I'll never buy Lexar again or, I'll, you know, I'll never buy Kingston. I mean, it was you like hear Seagate, all these Seagate for a while. People were Seagate. like, I refuse to buy a Seagate HDD right. because like 11 years ago, they had a slightly <laughs> higher percentage of failure than Western right. Digital did. And then my Seagate experience with hard drives was great. It's always Sorry, been good computer. for me. I, yeah. I always use them too, right? So, you know, it's tough. Obviously, manufacturers are going to have bad runs. They're going to have factory problems. Maybe it's a factory problem. Maybe it's wiring problems. Problem. Yeah. It sucks though that uh, people are saying that they're sending these drives in and they're not getting their data back, right? They're not getting recovery or anything. And yeah, we. And we well, this I is think the, the issue is Sand is putting their head in the sand here. Yeah. Like, yeah. Say something, recall them, do anything other than attempt to sell them at ba- bargain basement prices, knowing they're going to fail. Yeah. That, yeah. That's yeah. so sleazy. Everyone's going to grab. I mean, they're just going to type in two terabyte SSD into Amazon. You know, these will come up cheaper than everything else. And yeah, they're on their way to a big disappointment. Huge disappointment. So yeah, um, scary stuff. Right now, uh, we're working on a guide where we're saying, what are the best alternatives to these? And not only are we testing them, the reason we haven't written it yet, because we are still pulling some drives in from other companies that we haven't worked with in a while because they've all made new stuff. Uh, we're actually, if they don't tell us what's in it, we're going to crack them open and look nice. at what the actual NAND flash is in there. Yeah, so that's that you, much can, what have to do. you can follow the trail on like how good those are over time because we don't want this to happen to anyone else again. Like uh, Schloss, <laughs> David Schloss, a uh, friend writes for Petapixel, has his own channel. Uh, Dave tries this. He was using this drive and it when he put like as a working drive, it would crash out his computer. Yeah. Because while he was like oh, trying to use uh, DaVinci Resolve, and as soon as yeah. this was disconnected, his computer was fine. Like these are hardcore failing, failing, and it's not okay. And I feel terrible for him. But if you've ever seen David Schloss frustrated, I wish I was in the room while this was going on because he is very capable of expressing his displeasure in a fun way. So shame I wasn't in the room there. <laughs> oh man, that sucks. All right, well, on to more interesting, well, more fun news. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> what could be more fun than hard drive failure? It's fun. <laughs> Jordan, you With were David excited Schlossera. about this. Le- lead us into this, the, uh, the, the, the Contax G2. Yeah, so the Contax G2 is kind of a legendary camera. Like people kind just, of. Okay, it's straight up legendary. absolutely legendary. Come on. Um, I mean, it's kind of considered like the pinnacle of rangefinder design. For like a, this is a film camera. Um, but I know that the prices on them used is still extremely high. This is something I wanted to ask. So, cause Chris, I played with this a lot when we worked at the camera store yeah. and lusted yeah, after it. And lusted. I never actually took one out and shot with it. Have you actually yeah. shot with a G2? Yeah, they're beautiful. I, you know, it's, um, the lenses are great. Uh, the controls are fantastic. They've got a solid weight to them. I mean, they were interesting as an autofocusing camera even given the era, like autofocus back then, especially in cameras like this, wasn't blitz blitz fast. But with wide angle primes, some depth of field, you could actually pull off some really nice street photography. So yeah, they feel gorgeous. The controls are nice. One of my favorite photographers, Dave Beckerman, he does beautiful stuff in New York City, like gorgeous stuff. And it was all G2 and he would shoot a lot of sort of on the street from the hip kind of stuff. Just, just beautiful photography. You should check out Dave Beckerman's work. I, I don't know if he's still shooting or not. It's been a long time. Well, he's going to yeah, be shooting with the camera. new 8500 dollar version of this right i don't know that's gonna inspire them to get back to the streets (laughs) yeah so this is the thing right i mean these are expensive cameras but use they're like 1500 bucks 2000 bucks right so casablanca this uh, fashion line that makes uh, very colorful shirts they've decided to i'm assuming buy good condition ones used who knows how many refurbish them sorry i don't know how many they did because we don't know how many how many they sold out yeah. They're, they're gone now, so I didn't I didn't know how many... Like, obviously, they were going to sell out because they can't make more of them. But, like, no. I'm curious exactly how many of these they got their hands on. And then, <laughs> as they say, hand-applied ceramic multicolored coatings yeah, all over them. Yeah, they Cerakoted them. Yeah, they Cerakoted them. So, so if you're nice listening rugged. to the podcast, go immediate... Like, pull over if you're driving your car <laughs> and look at this thing. <laughs> you need uh, context. So <laughs> link in the description below. It. It yes. is, I, okay, okay, it, do your best to describe this without without just saying it's got a lot of colors. Go, Chris. Uh, it looks like a child's learning toy to teach <laughs> primary color theory. Uh, it's, uh, yeah, it's yeah, every yeah. primary color you can think of, every secondary color you can think of. It's hideous. It's straight up, it's hideous. I, I, I think it's pretty gross, but it's a collectible, right? It's hideous. 
<laughs> so um, I showed this to Jeremy Gray, one of our writers, uh, who we've actually recently promoted to editor. Congratulations, and Jeremy Gray. I, he's very excited, so I'm happy for him, too. <laughs> um, I showed him this, and he said he was when we were describing it to him he expected it to be ugly he had no idea how ugly it actually was and then followed that up immediately with i want one yeah so, four year, it, four year olds would love it too by the way i think it's it's beautiful if your idea of street photography is the person on the street's face mouthing the words dear god would you put this thing out? <laughs> yeah then this is a, an incredible tool yeah it's, it's not, not exactly very, like yeah you're not going to be unnoticed while using this it's not a discreet camera but can you imagine wearing one of casablanca's like silk shirts in the same color pattern walking around oh <laughs> they never that's, see the they never see the camera you're holding you just oh, hold yeah, it I so the pattern it lines in. up yeah and i'm sure the shirt's like 1500 bucks so you're like 10 grand in to have this experience walking the streets with this thing i um, will say as expensive as it is which was 8500 dollars, it came with a lens mm-hmm. it came yeah. with a strap it came with one roll of kodak portra 400 good film and I mean, uh, that is expensive film but yeah so they <laughs> It's like My guess bucks a roll. <laughs> is this basically cost them probably forty two hundred dollars somewhere there? I don't know why I got so high there. Forty two hundred dollars to actually make this, so they just doubled that for the oh, sale man. price. But like getting a good like a, like either mint or high quality, as you mentioned, Chris. I actually looked it up on eBay. It's anywhere from fifteen hundred to thirty five hundred. I don't know where they got enough of these to actually make a line of them to sell i don't know maybe they only got five though right i mean we have no idea what number it could have been four it could have been ten like you know we don't know it probably wasn't that many but uh at least the sarah to do at least a hundred right if you're if you're a fashion brand maybe no less no and I, I want to know. know how much they're paying the person who is hand applying this ceramic to it, going blind <laughs> from the colors they have to stare at for days doing this. I mean, I, th- I think it would be hard to break even. <laughs> I mean, they're talking, you know, this is Cerakoting. It's rugged. They're talking about hand applying like with a spray gun, which means they probably took it all apart. Maybe they did some hand painting, but yeah, it's, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's hideous. I want one. Yeah, I wish. Well, we could, everybody could wants one. one. Of course, everybody wants one. Do you want to pay for one? No. No. Think they'll send us a review sample? Again, I've no. never shot with a G2. I'd love no. the opportunity. Will they Casablanca. be worth $20,000 in a decade? Probably. Probably. Ugh, Probably. All right. All right, moving <laughs> on. Uh, so I don't know if anyone knows this because it is. it doesn't necessarily feel that intuitive. But on if you're using an iPhone, like Jordan and I do, Chris, you wouldn't have this problem. Singling me out. Okay. But as an Android user, this might directly affect someone just like you. If you were to get a new drone, you could just immediately download the DJI Fly app on your iPhone and then connect that to your like you know little controller. If you didn't get the one right. with the integrated screen, and you're good to go. But right. if you're on Android, since 2021, DJI has put no support for anything on Google Play. You have to download right. it directly from their website. If you don't, the do safe that, way. Yeah. yeah, you have to. You basically have to sideload it. Essentially, yeah. um, I, I asked DJI why they did not say. Mm-hmm. Um, it's very easy to do, by the way, just for us Android users. No, it's not like all. it's hard, but it's not intuitive. But people won't know to do that. Like when I was reading this news story, I, yeah. I mean, again, maybe it's because I'm in my happy Apple land or something. It would <laughs> never occur to me to like never. look at the instructions to find out where to download the yeah, app you to would use immediately just my go to drone. The store. Of course I would. Yeah, yeah sure, that's, that's, your that's first what go-to. you would do. Well, is don't this, do that. So, so here's my question for Chris. Like, is this a common thing? Like, are there a lot of products where it's not recommended to go on the Play Store and look no, for your not apps? There? Really? I mean, that's the beauty, though, of of Android users. It's the wild, wild west, right? I mean, it's the free market. It's it's the the this, the thrill that's of it's a of it's danger. a crime ridden alley. It seems. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> this is sure. This is literally a back alley where you're going to get shanked <laughs> because every single <laughs> app that's on there is fake. And what's kind of making this worse? is you wouldn't necessarily know because DJI makes its SDK or what it was, APK, I guess is what it is here because it's an app. That's available to download so you can build apps for DJI. They were able to just download the APK, build a complete clone replica of the actual experience, put it on the Google Play Store, and then steal your information and money. They will yeah. charge you for a subscription that you don't need to pay. This is not DJI does not charge you a subscription to use its apps. They'll make you do it. There's uh, one dude got charged forty bucks 
just for downloading the app because he thought that that was the way it was supposed to be. It's and true. I mean, you know, we're, we're in a place now where you want convenience, you want it to be at your fingertips and you make a lot of assumptions that everything is safe and that you're going to be okay. I mean, luckily the, there's a big community, so this stuff doesn't last very long, but it's sad. For sure, it's playing it's whack-a-mole. Every time yeah, Google yeah. takes down one, another one will get uploaded. And but you know what's even more criminal, though, is you Apple users treating us Android users like we're redheads in the 1800s. I mean, that's just, that's terrible. Stop doing stuff like this. Yeah. <laughs> this, this doesn't inspire me to, like, second-guess my choice of operating uh, system, Chris. For, for years, I used to be on Android. Back when Android first launched, the, the, the store for Android was always like a – you'd always squint before you hit that download button. You never <laughs> knew exactly what you were getting. I had assumed that in, like, the last eight years of being a legitimate – like application a, a, a op- operating system that this would have disappeared but it is apparently still a problem i don't want to download anything from the app store now that just scares me because if google is not catching obvious scams because i'm sure dji told them no we're not on your system anyone who claims to be dji is lying they, right. it doesn't work they can't catch it well, and the big thing too is, I mean, DJI is not what they used to be, where it's like specifically for like aerial enthusiasts or something like that. Like m- th- most of their sales are probably consumer products of people who are not, you know, super into it. They're not going to read the Petapixel article or listen to this podcast saying, yeah. whatever you do, don't download those apps. I mean, yeah, it's, the it announcement sucks and for it's this, so weird they can't sort it out. The announcement for this, Jordan, isn't even on like DJI's main website. It's on their forum. It's a forum post Ugh. from DJI. So it's not, it's not that easy to find unless you know where you're going. And I don't know right. about you, but nobody I know uses forums anymore. Yeah, so like... like like whatever their issue is with the app store, I think it's just worth putting their full software on there. You know, even if they're taking a hit on like I don't know licensing fees or whatever their issue is, because they they're should. not commenting on it. No, um, and and just put something on there. So yeah, I mean, basically, as long as they keep it where you have to download their software directly, their new users are going to keep just keep on getting taken for a ride. So the only solution I can see for this is put the official app back on the store. You know. Whatever yeah. issues they have, that's the only solution I can come up with. Yeah, but then nobody will click on it after this. <laughs> and then DJ will have to be like, it's okay, you can click on it now. It's safe. It's safe. <laughs> yeah, the title of it will be DJ Fly, the real one, we swear. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we swear, please trust us. Yeah. All right. Oh, well, man. president right. of the company just pointing to the app. Like, it, <laughs> this good. is it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, la- last bit of news that I want to talk about. It is not photography related at all, but it is so weird that I wanted to get your input on it. <laughs> this morning, I got the press release for this. I'm like, this, there's, no, there's no angle for us here at Petapixel, but it's still interesting. So the story I'm showing you all now, if you're watching this, is from The Verge. Uh, LG now sells a bizarre TV in a suitcase. You c- it's called the <laughs> LG Standby Me Go. And it is a 27-inch 1080p television for a thousand dollars that is connected to and lives in a suitcase and you pop it out it has a built-in battery and 20 watt speakers and their image of when to use it is very clearly what you guys were just doing camping so (laughs) yeah (laughs) <laughs> Why bother looking at Mother Nature? I love, you, I love how... <laughs> the the love really how weird the, thing about the screen is it can only play Rob Reiner's movie, Stand By Me, which I think is a really <laughs> weird yeah. decision. I love how, I love how these, the, the photo they have on, their, on the article on The Verge, it's like these two people sitting in chairs, they're having their food, they're having, they've got the thermoses, they're watching this TV in the back of the car, and they've got like this beautiful landscape behind them. There's like trees and Forget nature, that landscape. and they're like... They're like, to hell with that. Like, I want to see uh, whatever Netflix uh, wants to show me. Like, it's, it's, <laughs> and, and it's not new. I mean, we've had this kind of stuff forever, right? Like, this is just the latest. It looks sexy. But I mean, people, I'm sure, used to bring out those four inch TVs camping back in the 90s. Why not? You know, when Jordan and I were, were out camping in BC here just last week, the, the folks across the way had like a mega trailer super mega motorhome and in the side of the motorhome they had a built-in tv and they're doing like movie screenings for the kids around the fire so i i get it is it really that egregious compared to all the tablets that we're taking out and the phones and stuff like that yeah sure (laughs) i mean 
<laughs> why I don't why know. go camping? No, I totally agree. I mean, I wouldn't do it personally. I think it's I think it's silly, but uh, as a person who is recently camping, let me tell you, Jaron, sometimes you want to enjoy your camping experience and the beach and your kids are annoying you <laughs> and you put a screen in front of them for like 20 minutes so you can drink a delicious Clamato Caesar and <laughs> listen to the waves lapping at the shore while the sounds of bubble guppies reverberate from behind you. That is okay. true bliss. Okay. I, I can I just, see that. You're going to piss off everybody nearby, right? Cause this thing's got speakers, it's blaring stuff like, or actually uh, no, hang on. No, don't do that because this can only play the movie stand by me, which is has adult content on it and dead bodies. <laughs> yes. So, uh, never mind. Don't show this to your kids. Can it, it like, can it take some rain? Can it take like, no. I don't know. God, it no. looks, you close you the can, luggage. If it's yeah. You got to close that in the box. If you're not using it, it will ship with a, uh, X boom, three sixty speaker, a normally $250 yeah. speaker. If you <laughs> buy it, like if you pre-order it, it's shipping at the, uh, the end of August, just in time for camping season to start winding down. They yeah. also show that it, people using it by a pool and it appears to have a touch screen. So you can use it like a gigantic tablet if you really want to with wet fingers thank, poking thank at it, God. not responding to your well, inputs in the picture. Only thank, his thank, feet are wet. Thank God. The screen goes vertical though, so that we can still watch like TikTok. Instagram reels and TikTok. Yeah. 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 YouTube Endlessly shorts. until we, yeah. While like, while like animals come out of the woods and look at you and do amazing again, you're <laughs> no, just no. like, Oh, you know, like this Tunnel vision on the screen. <laughs> yeah. Like it's, I don't know, but we already know the society's over, right? It's, this is just, this is just another sign of the end times. We're doing good. All right. That was fun. What a weird product. Uh, Chris, what have Good you been up fun. to? <laughs> so, yeah. So check this out. I got something to show you guys. So, yeah, we were camping, of course, which we were gone for like a week. And my garden's been sitting here. And it's been like hot. It, we've had a lot of hot, dry weather. And look at this. Look at that. That. Oh. It's not a sex toy. It's a zucchini. Look at the size of my zucchini. Hey, what do you guys think? That's a good size zucchini why is it so bulbous because it's mine (laughs) i grew it you grew that all on your own it it is a it is it looks like it it spent all of its energy early on and then just decided to get longer near the end it's a beautiful zucchini don't don't. the colors pop it's it's a little little robust around the middle but it's doing great so i'm totally going to chow down on that but yeah that's that's been my week is coming back my garden has flourished without me i should spend more time away from it Chris, what do you um, use zucchini? Like, what is your dish that you would use zucchini in? I actually hate zucchini. I don't. Oh, I knew disgusting. it. It's gross. <laughs> I'm with you, Chris. I hate all squashes. But actually, here's the thing, but... though. I will. I will guarantee you. Every single time that you point to a zucchini and say it's gross, someone will bring up their stepmother's or grandmother's zucchini cake recipe. Hundred okay. percent. In America, yeah, we guaranteed. call that zucchini bread, and also sure. using it in there is the best way to hide the flavor of the zucchini. Yeah. That's Of course, it's going to taste good. And they just say, oh, it's so moist. And I know we're going to get comments. People are like, oh, no, no, you haven't tried my zucchini bread yet. You'll see. So if anybody It's moist wants because to ship- of all the oil you put into it. <laughs> I'll ship this zucchini out to whoever wants to turn it into a luscious cake. Just send a bunch to Jaren. Yeah, do- please don't. <laughs> I- Payable on delivery. <laughs> I cannot stand zucchini. And I'm starting to realize that I do like cucumbers a little bit, but I don't like them enough to grow them. I mean, oh, alternatively, you can use it as a sex toy. So, you know, it's a win-win. He it's a beautiful back zucchini. To it. And uh, yeah, there you go. It's beautiful. So, jo- Jordan, do you have any... Um, can you r- beat my zucchini? Yeah, I don't rod-shaped so. things that you've done in the last week? <laughs> you know, I've done almost nothing phallic-shaped this week, Jaren. So... Uh, Uh, I did want to throw out just as a quick conversation piece. Um, So I started watching the new uh, Apple Plus series Platonic, um, which is just a very pleasant seven and a half out of 10 uh, with Seth Rogen uh, and Rose Byrne, who were seen together in the movie Neighbors, had wonderful chemistry together. Uh, So they made a whole sitcom about them. And it's just a very pleasant, you know, chatty. uh, The idea is she's married. He's a friend can we do a sitcom where they don't actually like fall in love and not really a sitcom right. more like an indie film kind of thing. Anyways, it's a good, like I recommend it as just like a chill out. It's not earth shattering, but it's good. But I want to know, uh, what are your best Seth Rogans? What does that mean? Like Seth well, your Rogan's top Seth general? Rogan movies. Yeah. Oh, like his best performance. Okay, oh, well then it's going to be take this waltz. All right. Sure. So that, that's what I was curious about. Okay. Yeah. What'd you say? It's going to be take this waltz. Take, take this waltz. This for waltz? Sure. I have yeah. to, I have to yeah. Google that. I have oh, never even heard of it. Incredible movie. He's great in it. 
It's uh, a Sarah Pauly film, a Canadian legend. She just made Women Talking, which everyone was very excited about because it's one an of incredible the best movie. I've ever seen. Yeah. Uh, before that, she made this movie, Take This Waltz. And I was going to say that is actually my number one Seth Rogen performance. Chris, what's your number two? I don't know. Pineapple Express. <laughs> uh, yeah. I actually have to IMDb this because I'm not sure what he's been in. Oh, okay. I, I am that unfamiliar with his work. That's I funny. I, watched, I thought this I mean, would be an I, easy so one. I, okay. I have a real soft spot for um, uh, The Night Before. The Night mm-hmm. Before Christmas? Is it The Night Before Christmas? Uh, I'm, I'm probably saying the title wrong, but I love that. With the JGL and Anthony Mackie and Seth Rogen, it's actually, it's actually, and Michael Shannon is like, Michael Shannon's Fantastic. incredible. Incredible. In yeah. Okay. Yeah. Wow. So they, they made a neighbors two. They did. Yeah. No, the night, the night no before one knows. if you haven't seen that, I highly recommend it as a Christmas time movie and his performance is very good in that too. So I'm going to go number two jobs. I think he's unbelievable in that oh, yeah, movie. Okay. Um, just playing a very different character from his usual one. But my number three, if we're going to do a goofy Rogan comedy, I'm actually going to go, this is the end. I think he's sure. fantastic in that. I mean, it's a similar vibe to the night before, but uh, another one of those, like not one of his big <laughs> well-known movies, but that movie rips. It's so But if you haven't fun. seen Take This Waltz, it's it's beautiful. It's well done. It's heartbreaking. It's, it's an incredible, movie. it is an art movie. movie. Like it's, it's, it's not so what you might yeah, expect of a romantic. Like it's enjoyable. Com- yeah. yeah. It's if cool. you were to have read me all of the things, he's been in in the last five years like read the titles to me i would assume you were just making up movies i have not heard he's of busy. any of these he's very busy um yeah. yeah lots of producing as well have you guys seen an american pickle that one i was i saw it on an familiar. airplane the only way anyone has ever seen that movie <laughs> <laughs> that's a fun the, movie the way the artist is good intended. in it yeah all right uh, uh jaron yeah. what have you been up to <laughs> Well, uh, as I mentioned last week, I bought a house. And when you buy a house, you start to notice all of the things that the previous owners have done that is somewhat uh, less than ideal. So like been... bones? Did they hide bones? No, they just painted oh. poorly. Not, <laughs> oh, oh. I'm not exaggerating here. There's not a single painted surface in this entire house that does not have at least two different colors of paint that were attempting to be the same color. Like they didn't try very hard. <laughs> And it is very obvious. My basement is what I would call the landlord special. It has nice. like, why why bother taking the covers off of the light switches? Just paint over they, those yeah. bad boys. I hope they left the hinges on all the doors before they painted and stuff like that. Too. <laughs> they yeah. did. Yes. Great. All the hinges have paint on them. Why? Why? Why take anything off? Why do anything right? Yeah. Anyway, that's what I've been dealing with. Uh, trying to figure out how much I need to repaint how many pieces of plastic I need to replace because they have paint on them, get all the hinges done. Noticing all the little things where they're just like, why didn't you make sure that your exhaust from your water heater was actually exhausting and not just going into your basement? Stuff like that. Just like little things. Because it's your problem now. Yeah, it's mine. Yeah, I get to do it. I did find out that the sprinkler system, which they didn't think was working, is actually functional. So I'm actually going to repair that next year. I'd also look for some bodies. I'm telling you. I'm going to go through the ground. So I will tell you what. I'll rototill and I will look for bodies for you. (laughs) Isn't that part of the inspection is like the body check? They just (laughs) just go around looking. Yeah. (laughs) I feel like I don't see an arm in the backyard. Inspectors. Yeah, they they ignore cadavers. They're not very good. (laughs) Yeah, they're they're looking for problems with the house. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, they for they, hauntings. No, they. <laughs> yeah, you should you should bring in a paranormal uh, researcher to make sure you're not haunted. At these swing around some lavender, that, or I think it's sage. You burn some sage. And walk it probably gets overly cold in a few rooms. It's probably not the AC. It's probably a ghost. <laughs> All right, that was fun. Uh, our, for our main topic today, you guys wanted to talk about one piece of gear that you'll right. never get rid of. Which one of you wants to go first? I'll go first because I cheated. Yeah. I brought two. Oh, two, you two piece of gear that because you'll never because get I rid do of. I do photo and video, right? Typical so. Jordan. Typical Jordan. Everybody does photo and video now. It's the day. Just it's the break age okay, of the hybrid. I give you permission to pull out two. Go rifle around in a closet no, 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 right no. now while I'm monologuing. <laughs> That'd be great. <laughs> All right. All right. Start Number off, one. This is. The first camcorder I ever oh, bought. Wow. I actually talked about it a little bit on the episode last week. It is crazy how much, like, the second I pick this thing up, how much <laughs> nostalgia I have. Like, I know everything. I know my thumb's going for the power <laughs> switch. It's amazing how much muscle memory I have here. I know everybody what? there that's watching the podcast saw Jordan hold that up. It's not out of focus. That's actually what 
cameras from that time. Yeah, they were all <laughs> blurry. Just, just very soft just edges. What, what, what model number is that? Like, who made it? What is it? This is a Sony TRV 330, TRV. a digital eight, which is really interesting. So what this would do is it would be backwards compatible with old high eight tapes that looked like cassettes. Or you could record a modern digital signal, same signal that you'd get with, remember, mini DV tapes, those cute ones? <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, it would record on that. And I got this specifically because in school I was shooting videos on Hi8. And I was like, well, those are all masterpieces. So I'm going to have to be able to go back and recut them because you could put Hi8 into this and then send a Firewire 400 signal into your computer and edit that. <laughs> and this was like cutting edge stuff my friends but what a it's sony funny. fanboy hey such a sony fanboy um oh. but the biggest reason i got this is it was the cheapest camera i could get with a manual focus ring and when i got oh. this i was becoming like a real film snob but i didn't understand how optics and sensors work so i was like oh man i'm gonna need to do those like rad focus pulls <laughs> it's gonna be incredible <laughs> with my quarter inch sensor that i've got on this thing uh so it was basically like do you want the shot completely out of focus or completely in focus were my two options but i definitely moved up to the next price tier to get that functionality <laughs> does this take memory stick this this does take memory stick. It will shoot a 640 by 480 photo to the Damn. memory stick. And I actually, there's an eject button right here. Check that out. Wow. This is a four megabyte. Pro? Oh, it's not. Uh, the face detection is too good on this camera. Uh, a four megabyte uh, memory <laughs> card here, which was included free of charge. Oh, my God. It. Yeah. Uh, it also <laughs> takes SD, I noticed. So it, it, w it did have some future... I usability no there's no sd whatsoever on this oh really according this to this sony amazon listing which is 500 dollars, by the way you can buy one of yeah. these for renewed oh, no they mean standard definition jara not sd oh, memory well, card it just says flash memory type sd comma memory stick duo so to me that's no, that is oh, definitely firewire man this yeah. thing is 640 by 480 used to be the bomb though oh, hey? I but mean, look i remember a time it, in the internet that was amazing it has a lank controller so i could hook it on to a big broadcast you know those big panning tripods with the record and the zoom rocker on them uh oh man this thing takes me way how back. are you going to top that with your second item jordan the other one is i because i'm baffled so this is a sony ef 24 millimeter f 2.8 um so this is going back my wife and i um well this was a gift i got for my i think it was our second year we were together i bought her this lens because she had an eos 3 and we always just shot it with a 50 millimeter uh, so I was like, I'm going to get a wide angle lens for it. And this lens sucks. It is not good. <laughs> the corners are terrible. I feel really bad. I was like, I got you a lens. We're going to go express ourselves creatively. It's actively bad. And for that reason, like there's no resale value on this. The word's out that this lens is not I just, good. So I'm I like, love that you I don't called know. it a Sony EF lens. I think that was Oh, crazy. sorry. Canon, it's, it's Canon EF. I was a little confused. But I <laughs> yeah. It. No. Uh, yeah. Canon EF, but uh, yeah, it's it's not worth enough to sell. And I mean, it's yeah, it's one of the first things I bought for Ev, and it's Aww. photography related. So yeah, no enormous sentiment. To, but I haven't put it on anything. I think in like dark. ten years. So because uh, yeah, it's it's not good. I don't know why I still have it. <laughs> I mean, it's hers, so I guess it's up to her to sell her sell it. But uh, anyways, that's what I got. Those are the nice. two things going through my whole house. I would not get rid of, or have not gotten rid of yet. Maybe if you want to, so and Canon. EF 24 mil. <laughs> I have one. That looks like it's it, like I can look at it and be like, ooh, that can't have very many metal parts. That looks oh, made look of at this. Plastic. Look at this fully metal lens mount, Jaron. Wow. Jokes oh, on fantastic. you. Yeah. Oh. I said very it many. Was... I didn't say none. Yeah. <laughs> I think <laughs> I think there might be glass in here. <laughs> uh, uh, thank you, Jordan. Chris, what do you got? Besides well, your, I guess... your move the zucchini. Oh, move the zucchini? Why are you it's going so the heavy. hardest possible route to move the zucchini? It's so heavy, I can barely... Oh, man. Okay. Oh my gosh. So I guess we're both going Nostalgia Land because I've got the Nikon FE here, which is my first camera. Uh, unlike Jordan's camera, it still has photographic applicable use today. Mm -hmm. I mean, we could still absolutely... I mean, that's why probably why I keep it. it around is, you know, I can shoot analog with it. We've done black and white videos before using it. It still runs great. It's as old as I am, 1979. It's probably in better shape than I am. 
Definitely got a whole bunch of lenses. <laughs> All the front coatings are scratched, which is wonderful because I'm an I'm a I'm an artist. I'm a pro. I'm not like a hack, you know. And uh, look, my little Nikon screw on button there. Ooh, so, Chris, I'm curious: is this the actual FE that you used when you were younger, or did you buy yeah. another one later? No, no, this is the actual FE. Oh, cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's the one thing that I never sold. That that's that I that's a good thing. MD12 on there. I bought that a, a little bit later. But yeah, my first camera. Still love using it. Chris, um, is that thing loaded? No, not. You at the should moment. let our listeners hear the shutter because the shutter on the FE rips. It's so the great. The problem is the battery. Here, I'll take it off because the MD12 batteries are dead right now, and they're probably corroding into a C. But here we go. By oh, you mic. hear that? By the mic. Oh. oh. Oh, that sounds like a picture. Automatic aperture priority based exposures. Ooh, quartz time shutter. Still accurate today. Beautiful camera. Love it. I don't know if I've ever, there's ever been a more beautiful camera made, including that Casablanca Contax G2. So <laughs> that's the runner up. <laughs> yeah. And then I guess, you know, if, if I have to show two, because Jordan got two, what's within reach? Uh, Another this gaffer vegetable. tape. Look at that. This gaffer tape. It's like a half inch thick. Really nice striping gaffer tape for when you want to do the most down useless whip cords, or I'll never get rid of this until it's empty and then I'll throw it in the garbage like it meant nothing to me. I'm looking for my gaffer tape here because I'm sure it's girthier. No, than no, yours. don't. No, you okay. already showed two. Don't show three things. Jeez. <laughs> Is your gaffer tape skinny like this? I've got skinnier gaffer tape. That's uh, it's, it doesn't hold handy. anything up. It's Why would you want such skinny gaffer tape? It was very so, thin. For the test chart, I actually used it to stripe the lines on the test chart. Huh. It was very useful for that. All right. All You'll right. never um, know. You need skinny gaffer tape until you use it. So I couldn't find it, but I know it's in this house somewhere. I'll probably come across it when, uh, when I when move. You move. Yeah, but um, there is one piece of photographic equipment I will never get rid of. And I'm just going to reference it because I brought something else because I couldn't find this. But what I would like to have brought was my Sigma 28 to 70 f 2.8 to 4 DG. Oh, Oh this yeah, is, classy. This is pre Kazuto, the current CEO of Sigma. This is back yep. when Sigma was making like very, very affordable alternatives to Canon like EF lenses. This was my first lens, and uh, I used this for years before I got myself a real lens, like one that was actually quite. <laughs> it's probably good. not great. One it's made like, by okay. Kazuto son. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. the The thirty five millimeter, the very first one that the art series. I think that oh, was the, oh, that, the one point four that changed that everything lens. for them. Yeah, that I remember getting that lens and being like, my my world is is so much better. And I like thirty five yeah. millimeter, unlike Chris. <clears throat> Refresh my memory, Jaron. That was also a really good macro lens, wasn't it? I think it had like pretty close focusing, the 28, the 28 to, 70? to 70, 28 to 4. The minimum focusing distance is a spectacular 19.7 inches. No, it's garbage. Oh, it's bad. Okay. <laughs> no, it's like the worst ever. It's horrible. It's um, like 1 to 46 lifetime. Life, life, <laughs> my version of it, so the, the, the neurals on it for focusing, or I guess the, the one that's for focus and for zoom, uh, they have become a little bit white, like the the rubber or whatever they use yeah. for it is starting to, to actually degrade. Uh, it is very unpleasant to touch. It's somewhat sticky. Um, but I will never get rid of this lens because it is my lens. But Okay, me, but are you never getting rid of it the same reason Jordan will never get rid of his because nobody in the right mind would buy it? Not one single yeah, it's Too actually, much hassle to sell yeah, it? It's actual okay. trash. Because people I, would buy this. People <laughs> would buy this right now. And people would buy this too. They right? would not buy the and zucchini, I, no. Or the gaff tape. Uh, I will say when I get my new studio put together and I, and I find that lens, it will be on a shelf behind me somewhere so that I can look at it and be perfect. Like, oh, so, right. so the white powder, is that like, remember back when the Canon XT four was starting to discolor white and they put out the press release that like, this will burn your hands. Yeah, your it's, like, it's like rubber effluent. Oh. Yeah. Is that the same uh, thing on your lens? If not, you know, handle <laughs> it with cotton gloves, Jaron. Rub Maybe. it on your eyes right now, Jaron. Rub it in your eyes. <laughs> I don't have it. I got to find it. It's in the basement. Somewhere. Lick it. Okay. Lick it. Oh, Ooh. um, <laughs> <laughs> what I actually brought is this. This is my mo one of my most prized pieces of gear, and it doesn't look like much. It is a black re rectangle, but it is a Peak Design tech pouch. I Ooh, look at that! Absolutely love this thing. Peak Design makes. I would say sometimes questionable comfort level bags, um, but they are always very like sturdy. Like it's hard to break a peak design product. Um, it's just, some people just don't like how they feel. Um, and I find the backpack to be a little pinchy on the shoulders, but this, which came out at a similar time and fits really neatly into there. This Ooh. holds everything I need when I travel 
when it comes to like my computer and when I am dealing with footage. This always travels with me and everything in here is specific to travel. I have a duplicate yeah. copy of everything I need. So I just grab this pouch and I throw it in my bag and I know I have everything that I need. Phone charger, watch charger, uh, computer charger, SD reader, C, uh, CF express reader. All of that is in here. Plus like multiple SSDs for backing up. How many oh, Sam, uh, how many SanDisk SSDs could you fit in that Jaron? So <laughs> many, I, I don't recommend it. Currently I'm how using broken woods. A Lex, uh, a let one. Sorry. A, 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 a let drive for that. Um, oh, that's a cutie pie. And it looks like all the cables like stay separate. So it's not a giant yeah, it's got, nest. Of, it's got separate little yeah. pouch. P- so you can see my mouse goes up here. The charger for the computer is here. There's the, Dang. F- I love this thing. It is not that expensive. And if you travel a lot for work, there is looks good. really almost nothing better for managing your tech stuff. It looks this. very good. So that's what I will never get rid of. I mean, it, I've had this since it came out. That's got to have been six or seven, maybe eight years ago. Not even like maybe one flyaway thread right here. That's it. This thing is as damn just dropped it because it's <laughs> I, re- I know it's reliable. Anyway, that, that was mine. <laughs> is the mouse OK? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a it's an Apple mouse that everyone hates. I, I have another one here. I like these. <laughs> I uh, apparently am like a masochist because I'm one of the only people that actually does. You can actually see. Look at it. You can see my uh, yeah. a reflection of the light that I'm currently being lit by right now. Oh, yeah. Looks Ooh. like a backwards three. It's very exciting. Razor. Like, it looks a little razory, doesn't it? That was not yeah. the intent. Um, <laughs> anyway. All right. There we go. That was uh, all the stuff that we'll nice. never get rid of. You guys should. Anyone listening, tell us what gear you'll, you will never get rid of. Uh, we will uh, talk about a few of them next week if we see some in there that are uh, are particularly good. So give us give us your comments uh, on YouTube or uh, send them to us via the Spotify app. You can you can send us questions there or statements yeah, or whatever. Or Speakpipe. I like Speakpipe. 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 We it's do so, have some so nice. Speakpipe like today. We that's a good transition for us. We're going into the tech support section, and we got three Speakpipe questions, maybe two. I think one of them is a. Uh, is written but here we go uh we're gonna listen to a message from hessel folkertsma boy that's tough to apologies say. hey pp professionals this is hessel from uh, maastricht in the netherlands uh just wanted to hook onto the holiday uh spirit there uh i just went on holiday to uh the new forest in south of england and i only brought my mamiya 6 multi-format and it got me thinking um, how cool, but very unlikely, would it be that uh, Sony would ever make a medium format rangefinder camera with only manual focus lenses? Um, so let's play a little game. Um, what would be the coolest, but also most unlikely thing for every manufacturer to ever produce? All right, there you go. Thanks, guys. So first thing I want to say to Hessel is thank you for saying, hey, PP professionals, because I'm not allowed to make that reference, really. So, I mean, I'm discouraged from it, and I don't. So I just don't I love like that it. You guys, I love that you guys are doing it. I don't like Nobody it can stop Hassel. you, free speech. So. You Look keep you, going. You keep doing, going. You're doing, Tim. <laughs> but you know what? I, I agree with Hessel. I mean, this, this would be amazing. We've talked about this a lot. Like, I want to see, like, a vintage style. I want a digital TLR, but absolutely, like, a lot of people talk about something a la... Fuji uh, film GX series cameras, the, you know, the medium format film cameras, or like a Mamiya 7 digital would blow my mind. I would love that. So, yes. But what's the yes. likelihood of this happening? Z- almost zero. Yeah, it's not happening. Yeah. More one- likely to have a major fashion manufacturer buy a bunch of prestigious used cameras and like redesign them with hideous colors. That's far more likely to happen. I, th- I think the one potential there i mean manual focus lenses the great thing about mirrorless is it's a short flange back so you can adapt your manual you know your uh, mamiya lenses onto that um you know i don't love the fujifilm gfx 50r they're like rangefinder styled one it's not my favorite camera to hold on to i don't like the control layout but i mean that is due for an update so if they make a nice one do that throw some manual lenses on that'd be really sure. cool what like i could a proper see rangefinder what i could like a, like see a real rangefinder yeah totally i mean that that would be interesting i don't think that'll happen. ever happen yeah sony um, is not going to make a medium format anything for themselves they won't do it no so one thing uh, one thing i might say jaron is because they make the medium format sensor 
sensors everyone's using right now. I could see them doing like a version of their, remember the RX1, RX1, mm-hmm. R2, mm-hmm. those fixed lens cameras? I would mm-hmm. love to see them take a stab at a medium format fixed lens camera. No. That would be super cool because then they don't have to set up a new lens mount for it. It's built right into it. Uh, it would be a luxury product, which is the way that a lot of um, yeah. camera designs are going now. Anyways, I could see them doing that and I would love to review that. Jaren's shaking his head, but I want to see something <laughs> cool and exciting nope. and interesting. Make it happen, Sony, please. Uh. They won't. Absolutely will not no, do that. No, I, nope. I, I'd go for interchangeable rangefinder, but yeah. No, but they're not going to do either of those things. If it's a medium format sensor, they're already out. They've, they've, they, the digital you guys, TLR. Digital you started TLR? To, you walked into the, uh, the business room to, to pitch this to the to the, the execs there, and you said medium, and they all stood up and walked away. Like there's, <laughs> there, there's, they've we have actually pitched. Out. <laughs> we have straight up pitched the TLR idea to execs, and uh, yeah, they nod. They, they, they like nod, nod very politely, but you can yeah. see the switch in their brain flicking off as yeah. soon as we start talking. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. The, his second part of that was the coolest but most unlikely thing every manufacturer could produce. We'll come back to that maybe. I'll think about that a little bit. I don't know if I can go on the fly and yeah. say That's, what I think. Uh, for every manufacturer question. is tricky. But yeah, yeah digital TLR, someone's got to do it. No one's going to do it. Uh, okay. Pentax is easy, a mirrorless camera. Uh. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> That's, that was a low blow. All right. Oh, no, it's just it's the Q. Right. Uh, Vince Garcia asks, am I the only one who would prefer not to use an Apple computer to do photo editing? I have looked on forums and articles and no one wants to give any advice or recommendations. For an artistic and free-spirited group, it seems <laughs> odd that they would... He's, Chris is laughing because he doesn't use Apple. For an artistic and free-spirited group, I'm assuming he's talking about photographers, it seems odd that there would not be a few rebels out there that just refuse to buy Apple products. So humor the few of us that do. If you could not use an Apple computer, what machine would you use and what would you look for? <laughs> wow. So I am, I'm a free-spirited rebel. That's nice to know. Apparently. I've never been described that Get way. Get that on a t-shirt I would buy Apple products. <laughs> I'd buy Apple products, but I do prefer to edit uh, on a PC. As you can see, it's right here. It's the Gigabyte Aero, uh, 15 inch. So the key things that I love about this computer, it has a 4K OLED display, which I think is something that Apple's always had as a great advantage. And for photography, I do appreciate having the extra resolution, just being able to see detail, zoom in, check that kind of stuff. It's beautiful. And it's very bright OLED, but of course, it's it's nice that Gigabyte will adjust automatically for when you're editing photos to a more realistic profile with proper contrast. Uh, and it is color profiled beautifully. So the important things that Apple's have for photo editing, it's nice to see that the PC manufacturers are doing. Um, this has an RTX 3070, no, 3080 in it, laptop. So it's like a 3070 desktop. And that's strong enough. The only downside is, I don't know if you can hear it right now, but it sounds like a jet engine. It's super loud. I'm sure uh, Jaren's designed a custom filter to keep that thing at bay. Yeah. Because that is a common problem with PCs. I've actually got yeah. like an EQ uh, little curve I've saved for when Chris is in using his laptop while he's speaking, when no, we've done like some software it. stuff. And yeah, oh, I absolutely have. I know where that thing is. <laughs> <laughs> right on the frequency chart there. Um, Jared, not- I'm really curious because you have like people coming to you with like on Petapixel, they review laptops. Yeah, this, um, this, this one was funny to me because like we review PC laptops all the time and nobody reads them. In fact, we have <laughs> actually gotten the, the publishers come down basically like we can't do these anymore. They get no traffic. Nobody cares. And it's like so when I see this, I'm like very clearly you have a problem. But yeah. the, the solution was sitting there and it's just not <laughs> being seen. Um, we have reviewed multiple laptops. And the thing is, I guess what I can tell you is there is one right now that is designed for specifically creatives. It's called the MSI Creator Z17HX or the Z1. The fun HX. names are another reason photographers don't like. They're imp- yeah, yeah, they're impossible to like. How would you know that? Um, this is a very good computer with some like you know it, it has a lot. It's very Apple esque. The main issue about it is it's not very upgradable, which for PC users tends to be a reason you would buy a PC is so you can upgrade it. With Macs, you can't really do that very often. Um, but I think here's what I would say: We've reviewed Razors. Uh, we've reviewed MSI. I have multiple computers here. The one that I think would probably be best right now is probably a Razer. And uh, I know that they have some, there's a like stigma with them that the hardware is not going to last very long. Uh, there's one in this household that is being daily driven pretty hard. 
uh, and it's been good for over a year and it shows no problems. So I have no issue recommending Razer anymore. Uh, you don't need to look too hard at your GPU if you're only doing photo work. Um, the the 4000 series from NVIDIA is way overkill. You'd be just fine with a 3000 series. I would I would probably go above a 20, 2080, go for a 3080 or yeah. 3060. Um, and then just get a very good CPU. Like Intel's 13th gen is very, very good. Uh, the only problem good. the only problem with all of these is, is we've already touched on it. They get hot. And those they fans, do. those fans have to work real hard. The other problem with PC laptops is in order to get maximum performance out of them, you do have to have them plugged in. That is not a thing you have to have to deal with with Apple computers. Yeah, so like there true. are a lot of reasons why photographers and, <laughs> and filmmakers use Apple computers because these these little things that, yeah. you know, you I largely treat this computer like a portable desktop, if that makes sense. Yeah, right. That's so what you generally have to do. Yeah, but I take it traveling. It's great. You know, yeah. I mean, obviously games, if you're into games, they're fantastically powerful for that too. Uh, so that could be an advantage for some people. It is for me. But uh, I, yeah, the, 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 the thermal throttling is, is probably the major problem, especially if you're doing like heavy video editing. And over time too, right? Your computer gets loaded with other programs and bogged down with stuff. It starts to slow down. So the thermal throttling can be an issue once in a while. It's, this used to be this great. used to be a problem with all computers. It was only in the last like yeah. two to three years that Apple actually made that not like a thing yeah. very much anymore. I yeah. mean, they still thermal yeah. throttle, but it takes a lot more to do it. it. Does I fig- I finally hit the threshold with the new um, the new Apple stuff uh, when I was driving out on our camping trip. There was a huge accident on the highway, and they closed the road for eight hours. So I'm like jackpot. I'm going to get some work done. But it turns out. <laughs> Uh, when you're low on gas and don't want to run the AC and it's 38 degrees Celsius out, um, you can edit 8K video for about 18 minutes. And uh, <laughs> then you, I've never actually had a laptop say like, too hot, we're shutting down now. And that is what <laughs> actually happened to me. So uh, yeah, it's that is possible. An extreme environment. They don't, wow. that's not normal. Um, yeah. Don't recommend it. <laughs> at least that we know it can happen. So anyway, if, All right. any, if anyone listening, if you say, yeah, you wish there was someplace to go with more computer recommendations that aren't Macs, please be loud about it and yeah, actually and read, on things. read the stories that we have already written because these are very expensive to produce and we've been doing it for basically a thousand people. But so basically... Like, to, to wrap it up, don't chintz on the processor. Lots of RAM is a good idea. Lots you don't RAM. need a crazy video card unless you can do video editing. Then I think it's worthwhile. And uh, earplugs. <laughs> we should get DL on the show sometime. That would be great. I know he's yeah. been he doing is. some reviews, but he's a great guy and he is Super wicked smart. smart. Yeah, So smart. He makes me feel so stupid just talking right, to him. All right. All right. Next. Th- okay. On. Sonic Mustang, which is this yes. the, best, the best name. Uh, <laughs> I have asked everywhere, including Nikon, Canon, Sigma, and Tamron tech support and have been unable to get a clear explanation of the differences between letting a camera autofocus at a distant object versus setting the mm-hmm. focus to infinity manually is there a specific distance at which autofocus becomes unnecessary let's say i'm panning a flying aircraft that's a mile away from me wouldn't it be simply to manually set my focus to infinity rather than have to autofocus lock to the target if i'm taking pictures of stars is there any difference between manually setting to infinity and autofocus a tech yeah, at tamron good. told me i'd get sharper images of the moon by using autofocus than by manually Correct. setting yep. to infinity is she nuts but what do i know Go, Chris. She's not nuts. <laughs> no, no, no. So I think the first thing to keep in mind here that we should point out is that manually focusing to infinity actually doesn't work. Um, mm-hmm. Objects like stars, objects like airplanes in the sky are not going to be at infinity. They're actually going to be a little bit in front of it. And so that's why in astrophotography, you can't just crank your, your manual focus all the way. You'll actually be focusing beyond them. So Because all lenses tend to focus a little bit beyond infinity. So, Chris, why is that? It's it's lens designed to make sure that you have some leeway in case there's there's a, a little bit of give in the manual focus. Um, so yeah, I would I would say manually focus, but you got to do it visually if you're like zooming in on stars. A lot of camera, well, not a lot of cameras. Some cameras have some really nice built-in technology to help you focus on stars like starry sky af uh, stuff like that, where it'll actually help you to focus automatically on stars. 
auto focusing on stars doesn't really work either unless you have that kind of technology specifically for it but certainly auto focusing on airplanes and stuff tends to work well especially with the new subject detection modes yeah i remember back when i was at the camera store we had um one customer who kept returning a lens uh, for not being sharp. And then we'd test it and we'd be like, it's fine. It's fine. It's fine. And it turned out what he was doing was just racking the manual focus, uh, all, as far as it would go towards infinity. And yeah, when you're doing that, you're focusing past what is actually infinity. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's going to give you substantially worse results. And I see a lot of filmmakers too, who are like, Oh, we're using a wide angle lens. So instead of pulling focus and actually marking it, they'll just be like, and at that point we're at infinity, we'll just swing the lens as far as it'll go. And then everything is out of focus. It's just something to understand with lens design. Uh, it needs to have that tolerance to go a little bit past infinity. And because of that, the focus scale can be a little bit unreliable. Yeah. So don't autofocus. It doesn't really work on stars, but certainly you can autofocus on planes. I think nowadays with subject detection, that works quite well. Uh, or use something like OM system, Starry Sky AF. If you have an OM system, that actually works really well. Otherwise, you're doing it the old school way and you're not racking to infinity. You have to zoom in visually on the back of your screen or in your EVF and then really try to get pinpoint autofocus. And even then it can be quite difficult. And if you've got wider lenses too, just focus slightly in front of infinity and stop down a little bit. Then your depth of field's covering the infinity mark and you'll get yeah. you know that's a great technique for doing landscape photography and stuff when you want to maximize your depth of field yeah dang really good that's answers awesome. guys good hey uh, we did it i have two questions that were submitted on SpeakPipe, but i'm gonna go to the written ones first and if we got time for those we'll put them in at the end okay. uh so these these ones were based on the last podcast i just wanted to put this one in here because i liked it caleb thomas media says i just love chris's chaotic dad energy that's yes, a perfect that's actually description. My, that's my D&D character's uh, official alignment. <laughs> uh, yawning Marmot, another really good, good name. Thing. These are very good. Our uh, this <laughs> listeners and viewers have the best handles. Well done, everyone. <laughs> so good. What camera did Jordan and Chris use to stream the last podcast? And how In did you trip, connect uh, it, PC. HDMI card or directly? It looked really good. Yeah, so we used the uh, our standard S52X for that, uh, which is what I'm using right now. Uh, I used it because you may recall there were some early episodes where I suddenly looked terrible an hour into it, and that's because the camera <laughs> overheated and it switched to my laptop's webcam. We don't have that issue with cameras with fans. Uh, the However, uh, I haven't had great luck with the USB connection on that. So what I'm actually using is an Elgato cam link that Jaron recommended. It's the same one he's using on his, um, which does do a nice <laughs> job. I will say it dumps a little magenta into the image. So I've had to do yeah. like a manual white balance to shift that a little bit. They tend to do um, that. That's something that I had with a previous... Um, USB dongle as well. When the pandemic hit, I grabbed one of those cheapy ones and it had that same issue, but quite a bit more extreme. So it's just something to be aware of. Color might not be. Am I magenta? You're looking pretty good actually, Jaron. So I don't know. Maybe it's a, it's just yeah. that, that Canon color science. <laughs> it's that beautiful. Yes. <laughs> and I'm Much aware that nobody asked. Canon color science. I'm aware that uh, nobody asked about my setup, but I'm going to say it anyways. I used a Sony a seven R five. And uh, I use their built-in webcam interface, their live stream, which is great because I don't need any sort of apps, no dongles. It's plugged right into USB. And then I reflect a little bit of green off of uh, the zucchini to I knew he was gonna my magenta skin tone. I knew he was going to mention the zucchini at least one more time. What? <laughs> the other thing I want to say, we were incredibly what, impressed with how good the little Sennheiser profile did sitting in between the two of us. Yeah, uh, I thought for That's sure we mic. were just going to get tons of bad ambient noise. And, you know, there was a train. There were some ducks. Yeah, but the train was, was not very bad. quiet. I didn't think I heard the ducks. I was very time. impressed. Uh, uh, one change I did make to my setup, just so people know, I mean, people were talking about hissing and pops and stuff. So I put on a pop screen. So if I say things like PP professional petapixel party, one. hopefully, hopefully that cut it. I don't know. Um, you tell me. To, to one last thing to add on to that question is um, the, the software we're actually using to record is the same one we're using here. It's Riverside. Uh, riverside.fm uh, that is what we use for podcasting and it worked it well. just fine well i mean it had some latency because of you know data but you know we we made it work uh through a cell phone even obviously it's possible uh final question about that podcast i believe last year this is from ksl 480 
four eight eight nine. I believe last year you guys switched from Rode wireless to DJI wireless microphones because the road was acting weird. That's true. I think it was generally fine at DP review, but after joining Petapixel, quite a few episodes you shot, especially in the city where street noise was very loud and distracting. Did you guys switch microphone systems again? Or was it not about a microphone, but something else entirely? Yes. So um, we did switch over to the DJI mics. However, one of my favorite episodes we've ever done, uh, Chris and I went out and did a portrait challenge against each other with the Nikon 85 millimeter F12 shot by our dear friend, Levi Hallwell, who braved the (laughs) elements uh, that most people would have just walked away, especially because he's not getting paid on it. We had a dump of snow and it actually shorted out um, both the DJI transmitter and the receiver was flickering on and off irregularly. I was hoping it was temporary, but it is still having that issue. Um, But I mean, that almost worked out for the better because I do want to keep on trying uh, the latest audio things, see what's good. And lately we've been using the Sennheiser UW. I should have checked the model number. It's in my bag right now. Jaron, what do I have? Do you know? Uh, uh, no. Uh, <laughs> I have the older ones, like the G4, G2. I can't remember what they are. Yeah, it's yeah. in the same series. It yeah. is a, I'm reaching my laptops very far away it's from me. That. Son of a biscuit. You know what? Uh, I will respond in the comments with the model that we're using. It's the drawback to it, I don't love that the transmitters are still double A powered. Mm-hmm. I think that's kind of wasteful and annoying. And I know Chris doesn't love it either when I have to chuck a couple double A's at him halfway through a shoot. Yeah. But it has been bulletproof. This is the first wireless solution I've had where we've had no interference issues, no drop off. Um, the receiver is USB powered and the battery life is fantastic on it. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's been EWD, a great solution. EWD? EWDs. I think ah. we're using Sennheiser EWDs. That is not the G series anymore. They change. I mean, mine are very old. Uh, they're old. Yeah. The, I don't know if this is still the case with Sens, but the last time, uh, the reason I picked them when I was doing video production is they're impossible to destroy and they work in all environments. Yeah. I was like, just going to say, like, the clients would drop thing these ha- things on brick floors, yeah. concrete, and whatever, yeah. you know, put them back in their hand, work just fine. Yeah, we, we used, used to G2s, G3s series. back in the early days. And yeah, yeah. we've never we'd never broken one. It was we just annoying. Soaking wet. We've dropped them in the water yeah. and stuff and dried them out and they still work. Like they're really great. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Uh, from the Canon R1 wish list video, hmm. Castile Vargas TV 7931 says, So nice colors in this video. Is it graded or is it one of the Lumix color profiles, Jordan? Uh, that was shot in Vlog. Um I used, if it's a bright day, uh, I generally use the um, Panasonic's nicest LUT. It's fun that they have a nice LUT and a nicest LUT. Why would I ever use the nice LUT? Like, screw that <laughs> thing. It's called nicest. It's called nicest. <laughs> That's great. Uh, as a ba- base LUT. But yeah, I love working with Vlog. I've always said it's my favorite log profile to edit. And uh, yeah, extremely flexible. Most of the time, if we're out shooting in high contrast. That's what I'm using. This is a common misconception though. A lot of people think, well, log is always best, but if it's not a high contrast situation, I do generally find a profile that's a lower contrast 709. Uh, so, you know, a lot less um, dynamic range to it, but very easy to work with in post. I find the advantages of log, the extra dynamic range, if I'm not taking advantage of that, I might as well have an easier time editing it. So on the Panasonics, I use their like 709 profile, which is actually what I'm in right now. You can see it's just pleasing, has a fair amount of dynamic range. Fujifilms, I use Eterna, Nikons, I use flat. Um, I have a preferred profile for every make. Sony, I use Asinatone. Canon, I don't know. I just shoot everything in C-Log because I don't really like any of their default profiles. Um, I'm missing one. OM, I use flat. <laughs> but you are color grading these in I some think way, that's right? Everyone. Yeah, yeah everything oh, yeah, sure. is tweaked. Nothing yeah. comes straight out of camera, and except for the podcast. But I've actually increased the contrast in the 709 profile specifically for doing our live stuff. So it looks yummy and Jaron doesn't have to do things. I, I really <laughs> like doing very little. That's the best. Uh, yeah. Nicholas Alexander Otto, this is now referring specifically to the content of that video. The How Canon about a R1 sensor for Canon without a low-pass filter? That would be my wish, and the option to put exposure bracketing on a button, like with the Z8 or D850, would be my wishes not mentioned here. Then again, I would just like to see this on the Canon R5 too. Sure. Yeah, Canon Although loves their seen- low-pass sensors. <laughs> Yeah, they do. Although we've seen a lot of modern sensors kind of have low pass filters, but they're very 
I don't know what the Weak. subtle low yeah. pass filters. And so in that regard, I, th- I think manufacturers are kind of, there was a time period where if the resolution was high enough, they ditched low pass filter to get noticeable, you know, uh, sharpness gains. But I feel like everybody's kind of gone back to modified low pass filters. Yeah. There's, there's still a lot without them on there. Yeah. Um, I, I think the last one Canon did without one was the 5DSR, which is going back like Blah, ten sense. years at this point. <laughs> I do not like that camera. I took no. that into a helicopter once and really regretted that do. decision. Yeah, uh, <laughs> but I, I don't think you're saying like Canon's developed. I believe it was with the 1DX3, uh, their new type of low pass filter with very minimal resolution penalty to it. And I yeah. think they're using something similar with their new mirrorless cameras. But and you know, I like that very 1DX sharp. Mark III. Mm, you do that like camera. that camera, Jaron. <laughs> I, I that might be going on the list of things I'll never get rid of because I love that thing. Oh. Um, okay. Last question uh, from Sphinx or S Fink. I'm going to go with Sphinx or mm. SF Inc. Could be any of those. Uh, phones have taken away some of the mirrorless slash DSLR revenue by producing great photos with their cameras. This is very timely. Oh, yeah. The video we <laughs> the just, video just, video dropped. just came out yeah. today. Yeah. Yeah. Is there any reason the mirrorless cameras can't return the favor and include some functional apps? Wi-Fi is already available, so why not further its capabilities? Also, I'd like to see security features to discourage theft of these expensive cameras, wouldn't we all? We would love yeah. to see that. Um, yeah, I just think- I mean, we've talked about this quite a bit, right? Yeah, we would like to see the mirrorless companies start to incorporate apps for sure. To, I mean, it'd be nice to have good apps. That's something a lot of people complain about, right? You know, the, the wireless sharing apps that they use. But some companies are doing okay now. But also just the computational technology. We'd like to see that come into play. I think he means like apps actually in the camera. And there was a camera that did try this. Yeah, the con- wasn't it a Contax brand? Or- no, 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 no. no we- there's- We've talked about it or recently. Galaxy brand. Galaxy. There, there was the Zeiss, which had light, light room in it. But the big one, yeah, is the um, Samsung Galaxy yeah. camera. I thought uh, it was the. I thought the Samsung NX series also was running on modified Android. So theoretically, if that if they had kept those going, wouldn't we have been able to do that? Absolutely. Yeah, they didn't yeah. give you the actual like home screen in android interface with it it was just running on a version of android but, but man, the galaxy imagine. was like a big old tablet camera um oh, yeah i remember that yeah but no we don't do that camera. we don't get those i think the main reason being is um developing apps is um hard and like doing it for different platforms is uh, extremely difficult so unless every camera manufacturer agreed to get on board with either iOS yeah. or Android, mm-hmm. there is, and I mean, look at it, people don't really develop for Google play either for, uh, you know, various reasons that we've touched on perhaps in this episode. Uh, like yeah. it, it's just like, it's just not easy for them. They, these companies would have to hire their own app developers to make mm-hmm. their own apps for their phones. And Sony did try this kind of, yeah. For a little while, they had a store, and then they're just like, nah, brah, and they, they pieced yeah. out of that. They, they don't have that anymore. Yeah, a lot of the functionality the was just added to the cameras. Do you think the manufacturers even want people going in and making different photo apps to run their cameras and tweaking the the color results they get and all that kind they of should. thing? They should. I don't know. They should sure. want that. They should sure, want more they? interaction. <laughs> <laughs> Probably not. But do not. they? I don't know if they do. You Probably know? not. I yeah. So. I mean, how many DSLRs are still floating around there because of Magic Lantern? Like a lot of people refuse to give up on that because it gives them so many useful yeah. tools. Yeah, and, uh, and that's the only mainstream example that I can come up with uh, yeah. for that. And only really for Canon, right? I mean, it, it never took off on the other brands in a big way. So I am going to play one of these speak pipe questions because it did have some some bit of urgency to it. So this will be the actual last one. This is from Nick. Okay. Hi, Chris and Jordan. I have the opportunity to buy an OM-1 with the Olympus 150-400 to f4.5 Pro. I currently have the Canon R5 with the RF 100-500 to and I use the extender, the 1.4 extender from Canon RF as well for wildlife. And I'm just wondering if I will see any benefits in going to the Olympus OM system for wildlife with the 150 to 400 pro lens over the canon r5 100 to 500 rf with the 1.4 converter and the ability to use the 1.6 times crop to get that 1000 ish field of view so uh, yeah i would uh, i would probably stick with the r5 and the and the 100 to 500 uh 
you know, with the extender, you're getting good distance. You already have the gear that camera focuses animal technology. Like the subject detection is very good. I don't know. I, I mean, I love the OM one. I think it's a great package. And I think the main emphasis moving to the OM one would be if you wanted more compactness, if, if, you know, that wasn't really mentioned here though. So if you were like going into really difficult locations, you wanted to cut your weight, cut the size, I, then I think the old one's an absolutely worthwhile purchase. That's a big lens um, though. The, um, that particular 150 to 400 one. is a big lens. Yeah. Is the 100 to 500 for Canon also large though? It is it's, also large. It's yeah. fairly large. Yeah. I mean, the one, there's a couple things that jumped into mind. First of all, we never, I want to review that lens. We never got a chance to review it. So I'm, which one? Uh, the uh, OM system, uh, uh, 150, 150 to 400, 400. the 150 to four uh, with the built in teleconverter. But remember, um, it's actually a faster equivalent lens uh, once you get to the very long end of it um, compared to the Canon, because that's like a seven one at the tele end Add a one four converter in there. We're getting very slow. Uh, we're past F10 at that point. Um so the OM does definitely have an advantage there. You know, you're at like F9 at the telly uh, as an equivalent aperture. But then your sensor's smaller. It is, absolutely. But the advantage to the OM is it reads out worlds faster than the R5. That's so fair. the R5, you do get that 20 frame per second electronic shutter burst rate, but it's got the jiggly jobblies. Which, that's the technical word I checked. And yeah. the <laughs> OM, shooting yeah, electronic yeah, yeah. OM is extremely fast reading out sensor. So if you want to use those very high burst rates, that's a pretty deadly combination there. But I mean, I wouldn't do it for image quality necessarily. Oh man, this is yeah. tough because he's got to change whole systems and there's no telling if yeah. he'll get something better from Canon that it, like it'd be cheaper to just get the new camera and keep the glass. I mean, that's where I'm kind of approaching it is if he was like, hey, I'm looking at these two potential packages, right? Then then there's a lot to think about. But if about. he's got he one already, already. has one. Yeah. You know, and the 100 to 500 always gets poo-pooed by the professionals, but I, I because it's not, a fixed aperture and it's not fast, but I use it plenty for wildlife shots. Uh, and it's, it's sharp. It's quick it focusing. Is. It's not too heavy. Like I actually really liked it. And I, and I chose it even over having access to the two, eight stuff and the F four primes and stuff. I was like, if no, he got an R three, I was about sensor, to say the yeah, sensor yeah. reads out much faster. You wouldn't have to get a whole new lens. You could, you could sell the R five, get an R three, although the R three is way overpriced right now. I don't think it's <laughs> anywhere yeah. near what Canon is asking for it in terms of value. So, I again, that's only if you need that. those crazy burst rates. I, I do like yeah. the OM one having the uh, the pre burst, you know, being able to pre burst buffer. I think that yeah, if he's birding pro cap mode, birding with an R five is hard. It's doable, yeah. but it's hard. Yeah, but otherwise the R five shoots pretty fast mechanical shutter. It's not bad. I like if, how we have given no answer here. No, we've ju we've just <laughs> muddied the waters. <laughs> well, I'm you on know what? Go to your Canon camera store. But it, it, go to your camera store if the R three actually works with your eye. Then pick it up, scoop it up immediately. <laughs> <laughs> Because yeah. it does not work with mine, and I keep being told what an exciting photographic experience that <laughs> is, and I just <laughs> have to sit and wonder. Um, You'll never know. You'll never know. It sounds like uh, yeah. it sounds like we're leaning towards keeping your Canon gear rather than buying a whole new thing. But yeah, I, I do. That'd I agree with my Jordan. recommendation. If you have a camera store you can go to, I would recommend trying some of these things out. If you're in Calgary, you should go to the camera store because it looks yeah. fun. I'd like store. to go there someday. Um, okay, <laughs> that will be it. Next week, we will answer some more SpeakPipe questions. I know I got one this morning, and I have, an, I have one from Joel Mark here that I do want uh, Chris to answer, but that'll be a very long uh, response, so we're going to wait until oh, next week. As all Chris's responses are. But uh, <laughs> I think that'll do it. zucchini is. Yeah, Chris is now, again, fondling his zucchini. Uh, that is not innuendo. That is literal. And uh, thanks, thanks, everyone, for, <laughs> for joining us. We'll see you all next week. It's a nice one for the listeners. Bye, everybody. Bye.